This is a Religica production. R-E-L-I-G-I-C-A. I'm here with Cassandra Lawrence, mediator and community educator, working at Shoulder to Shoulder, addressing anti-Muslim discrimination and violence through interreligious engagement and pursuing an MDiv in public theology at Wesley Theological Seminary. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you. Well, hi, Megan. So I know that you've been involved in conflict mediation for a while now. Um, what sparked your interest and, and keeps your passion for this kind of work alive? The short, long story or the long, short story of it is that when I was 18 years old, my church, the region of my church had a youth trip to Israel and Palestine. I grew up in California in middle class suburbia. And I went on that trip and we visited the usual holy sites and saw Jerusalem and saw the Dead Sea and saw the Sea of Galilee and did all these lovely, beautiful places. And one of the leaders of that trip was a pastor that was my pastor growing up, who was Jordanian, Christian, Palestinian. And so as a part of that trip, we visited some Christian peacemakers team in Hebron, which is in the West Bank. And when we arrived there, the people that were meeting us came onto the bus and like informed us of like what we would see when we got off the bus, which would be like soldiers standing on rooftops, heavily armed, other people like walking around the community, as well as settlers in groups um, like Jewish settlers in like large groups also with armed personnel with them. And so we went there and we saw there's a vegetable market there in Hebron that was directly addressed in the Camp David peace accords. And it was supposed to be opened as a part of those peace accords. So the day that it was to be opened, Palestinians went there to start reselling their produce as they had been doing for decades, centuries before at that market and were promptly arrested and taken into custody. So a few weeks later, the Christian Peacemakers teams went there as well to sell goods as per the peace agreement that had been signed and celebrated. And they weren't arrested, but anybody who came to do business with them were harassed or arrested. And so just seeing the closed market there And the fact that this peace agreement that was made uh, between all these men in high level positions wasn't being implemented on the ground. It was really like a case study that I hadn't ever seen before. I was 18, I had been out of the country, but had never been to a place that was considered a quote unquote active war, like, or a conflict zone. That's an amazing background story. And what a great calling to have. And I know in addition to your time in Israel and Palestine, that you also spent time in Uganda and Tanzania. In your time in all of those countries and in different contexts and different people, what have you learned about justice and how it's pursued in different ways? Or does it mean different things in different places to different people? Uh, Well, I spent about two months in Uganda, in the south of Uganda, um, near the windy and impenetrable rainforest there on the um, Rwanda-DRC border. And uh, another month in Gulu, which is in northern Uganda, where the Lord's Resistance Army were quite active and still are to this day. I went there sort of as a, as a research, as well as just to be a listening person to see like, what were people doing on the ground to understand their own everyday experience of these conflicts that get a global platform. And some of the things I feel like I've learned in doing that, as well as in looking and working with peacemakers from around the world now, is that People are incredibly creative and resilient. And we have a drive to find joy and find peace in whatever context we're in. And so we will keep doing that despite whatever conflict is happening around us. So even looking at like people living in refugee camps is that they're still getting married and having children and living lives amongst this incredible tragedy that's around them. And when it comes to pursuing justice, what I feel like I've come away with it is in realizing that for each context, they will see a particular issue that rises to the front that is the both symbolic, but also the driver for that community that they've identified as the issue 
that's standing in the way between them and like a peaceful, prosperous society. And that if we truly believe that local peacemakers are the ones to lead long-term sustained conflict transformation and mediation like those mediators in Northern Ireland are still doing to today, 20 years after the Good Friday Agreements were signed, we must take their lead. We must let them lead like on deciding what is best for their community and how they understand the conflict. Because one of the things when you study the different drivers of conflict is you see how different communities, the drivers are different. Yeah, absolutely right. And to talk to the people themselves instead of just coming in and be like, hey, you should implement this thing that I brought because I, in my tiny amount of research, suddenly feel like I am the expert. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> In an interview that you've had in the past, you said that one of the most important things that we can do as peace builders and people working and to promote justice is like to show up and to listen. It's easier to like see how to do that when you have a conflict that's right in front of you. Mm-hmm. But how do you do that in everyday life? Or how do you how do we embody that practice of showing up and listening? I mean, I think when we have such blatant issues to deal with on the generational level of racism. I think the biggest thing is just educating yourself. This is one of the things I love about Facebook is that I have a pretty diverse group of friends on Facebook. Now I will admit that my diversity is not so much on the political spectrum, although there are the, or there is that in there. It is mostly on the progressive uh, middle to far left, but they share pieces of writing, of blogs, of newsletters, of videos that are circulating within each of our own communities. And then I get to read those and listen to those. And so see stuff from the root and see stuff from like the black women's movement without actually ever even having to do the vulnerable work of showing up in a room to a Black Lives Matter meeting. I can just do the reading. Uh, at the very least. For me, what it's come to, especially in the last few months as I've been doing different studies at school, is thinking about the term neighbor and what that means, especially in our Christian theology, and looking at the different parables, both in the Hebrew Bible as well as in the, the New Testament. And the thing that struck me about, especially Kierkegaard's conversation on love And what does the greatest commandment mean? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The question that Jesus asked was like, who is your neighbor? Was sort of a trick question at the end of that parable. Because they were all neighbors. The Samaritan, the priest and the Levite, and the person bloody on the side of the road were all neighbors. Because the word neighbor means simply the person nearest you. And so the person nearest me is my neighbor. However, the difference in that story was that the Samaritan responded to their responsibility and recognized the tools that he had. So when you look at the story and the way that it's told, you see that the Samaritan puts the man on his donkey and then takes him to wherever to the inn and pays for his lodging and so on and so forth. But at the beginning, when you hear like the two other men walking on the side of the road, there, there's nothing about their like their donkeys. There's nothing about their money. Like it's just told about their position within the community. However, this is a long road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And these are people of status. They're walking on this road. I can bet you that these people were not alone on that road and that they likely were riding donkeys or had other things around them that they could help. They had tools, but they didn't get close enough to their neighbor to know their actual needs. And they were so afraid of being, of their plans being changed. They didn't want that interruption from God. They didn't want their plans to be interrupted. And so they didn't respond. To me, when we're talking about showing up, it's about being close enough to my neighbor to know who they are and to know what their joys are and to know what their concerns are. So like when we're talking with our Muslim partners for shoulder to shoulder, one of the things that we've talked about with them is that, yeah, anti-Muslim discrimination and violence is an important thing that's on the minds of many Muslims in, in the United States. So are 
the state of our schools. So is gun control. So is the economic injustice and poverty in the country. All of these things are important to our Muslim neighbors. And so in me drawing close to them and being in relationship with them, I see their full humanity. And that is a gift to see them not as just victims of anti-Muslim discrimination and violence, of, in, of a long history of racism and enslavement, of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, but to see their full humanity and their joy and how they've lived life amidst the pain. And that is a gift for me because then I get to see how that is possible. But it's also a responsibility to me when I realize that I have tools that can be used for whatever causes that we decide are important together. And so for me, it's about addressing anti-Muslim discrimination when there's no Muslims in the room and saying, you know what, actually Muslims, like the ones that I have met, they care about a lot of things <laughs> or like Prayer is like this one piece, or like I have friends that wear hijab and don't wear hijab. I have friends that wear it because of political reasons and I have friends that wear it for religious reasons. And so that I can act as like a person that's able to like share my friendships with others. I have a friend whose prayer, daily prayer is, please God, give me the tools I need to love the people that you put in front of me. And so, my calling in life is to be, I'm a student of love and a student of love and not this like nice Valentine's thing with these giant mylar balloons and whatever, but the hard work of becoming as deeply invested in their worth as I am in the worth of my brother, my actual blood brother and of my parents, of them becoming as equal and as important to me as my immediate family. And that is that kind of love and that kind of responsibility and awareness of my own tools and awareness of their full humanity that will bring us closer to each other and will change the world. Um, and has changed communities and has changed relationships when we're able to enter into those full relationships with each other. Thank you. I guess as a last question, what gives you hope for the future? Laughter. Laughter gives me hope. <laughs> and like, seriously, the, the, the drive for humans to find joy, it's both heartbreaking and humbling and hopeful to see kids in like refugee camps who are just playing ball, who around them is all of this hardship and they're living through it and they're experiencing that. And yet they're still finding place to play. And in the incredible drive of humans to work together and to find a better world and for flourishing for themselves as well as for their neighbors, however they define their neighbors. If we all just took care of the person right next to us, then everyone would be taken care of, wouldn't it? That our Christian responsibility is to take care of the person next to us. And there's how many billion Christians in the world? If we just took care of one other person, that's at least two billion people in the world that are taken care of. <laughs> Thinking of my own Christian responsibility. But that gives me hope that, that, we, that there are people that truly want to learn and love the person in front of them and next to them. And we're willing to learn how to do that and to to humbly admit when we screw up and to be held accountable for those screw ups and to continue to work for that justice and for that better world that we all know is possible but aren't quite sure how to get there except through getting to know each other and working together. This podcast was made possible by Religica Allies.